Great. Hello, everybody. I will just share my screen properly. Um, now, I'm just going to talk very briefly and reflect on the role of digital humanities in this project and what projects like this can also contribute uh, to the field of digital humanities, so the relationship between the two. Uh, as John mentioned at the, uh, the start of this, I'm a professor of digital humanities in the University of London, and I'm director of a very new digital humanities research hub that's been set up in the School of Advanced Study to try and bring expertise across the institution together in this field. And um, before producing this presentation, I went back to have a look at the set of values that as a team we put together when we were setting up the hub. And they fit really well with the work that's been going on in this project. So one starting point is that we have an inclusive understanding of digital humanities, which involves learning from digital research practices that might fall outside that particular disciplinary framing. And I think there's a lot of really interesting, exciting digital work that goes on in cultural heritage institutions that probably isn't called digital humanities, it's called something else. And finding ways to intersect with that and share knowledge is really important. Um, we also have a commitment to practical, responsible and ethical openness. And I'll talk a little bit about the value of openness throughout this project, but you've already seen from some of the demonstrations, uh, the commitment that there's been to making code um, and tools and so on open throughout the lifetime of the work. Uh, we also have a commitment to exploring and demonstrating the value of digital cultural heritage, whether that's born digital material or digitized material. And again, this project fits very squarely with that aim. And it's also about working as far as possible with responsible and low impact technology. And you heard Callian mention the low training data requirement there, but it's also around um, using good work that other people have done. So Wikidata, as Jamie mentioned, has been used a lot. So we build on the work that other people have done rather than repeating. So it's a really good fit uh, in terms of where a typical digital humanities department sits. Um, something else that has been really important during this project for me is the importance of collaboration and conversation. So it's the value of bringing together different skill sets and perspectives, uh, in this case, cultural heritage, digital humanities, data science, history, research software engineering, and others that don't necessarily fall within those labels, as I mentioned. It's also about building on long term partnerships, and that helps to establish a common language and shared understandings during a relatively short project like this one. Uh, so we started off, John mentioned at the beginning, uh, Rhiannon and Lewis is a jointly supervised PhD student between the Science Museum and um, the University of London. And then we moved on to this project on which Rhiannon had a very important role as well. And then we'll move on to another um, discovery project that builds on some of this work. So um, this kind of large scale activity becomes much easier when you're building on existing relationships. I'm also struck by the translating or bridging role of digital humanities in complex digital projects like this. And this is something that we talk about quite a bit in digital humanities is being that bridge between data scientists and research software engineers, and perhaps people working in a history department who haven't usually been exposed to digital methods and helping to translate and make sure that everybody has the same assumptions and understandings. We were also struck by the value of conversation just within the team, but also outside the team for generating ideas. Uh, and Tim Boone, who'll speak later, organized a, a workshop, for example, where curators who weren't directly involved with the project were brought in. And that sparked really interesting ideas for future research and meant that the digital project was really grounded in what the museum wants to achieve. There are also plenty of opportunities for formal and informal knowledge exchange, including hackathons, as you'll hear about, workshops, events like this, uh, the opportunity to contribute to um, Zotero bibliography, uh, various ways of making sure that different voices are brought in. 
And that all leads to the co-creation of knowledge and outputs, recognizing contributions wherever they come from. So that this isn't a, a top-down project, but it really does involve everybody's opinions. And I think that's been really demonstrated in the pattern of co-authorship that's emerged uh, over the last 18 months or so. Uh, this is an article, for example, that was co-authored by Callian and John uh, on a machine learning framework for building linked open data from museum collections. Um, and this blog post is actually one of my favourite outputs from the project, and it established a really nice precedent for this kind of conversational way of working. And Tim and Callian here just talked through their understandings and explored ideas together and then published that conversation as a way of helping others to understand the project. And I think that dialogic process is enormously valuable in projects like this. I think it's also highlighted the importance of experimentation, which is something that is increasingly talked about in the humanities, um, particularly with digital humanities labs, for example, which focus on experimentation. And there are multiple elements to that flexible, iterative ways of working uh, in support of agreed high level aims and objectives, of course, but within that, there's flexibility for people to develop their own ideas and interact in ways that might not have been planned at the outset. And some of that's about encouraging a playful approach to working with data. And you'll see some of that in the outputs from the hackathon later. It's not always about working towards a monolithic goal and, and you know, project deadlines, of course, are enormously important, but having that playful approach, allowing people just to try things. I really think we've seen um, huge dividends from that during the course of the project. And something that can be a bit challenging, I think, is acknowledging that positive results are great, uh, but negative results are also useful project findings. So that time playing with data isn't wasted. Um, there's value in identifying that a particular approach or tool isn't suitable and then sharing that information with other people. So it may feel like a dead end, but actually it's an important step on the road. Uh, there's also the idea of a minimum vi viable product. And I, I have to acknowledge uh, for my thinking around this uh, conversations with the team at the Living With Machines project, this idea that a data set or tool may not be perfect, and it certainly won't be in the course of an 18 month project, but is it good enough to release publicly and allow other people to start to experiment themselves? And the answer is very often yes. Um, but along with that comes the requirement to be explicit about experimentation so that expectations can be managed and you don't have angry researchers demanding to know uh, why this doesn't work in quite the way they expected it. Uh, and these are the demonstrators, obviously, that Kalyan has just been showing as part of that opportunity for us to experiment as a team, but also to allow other people to play with the data. I mentioned openness as being one of the kind of foundational values for my department, but it's also fundamental to digital humanities across the board. So this project really has embraced radical openness from the project inception to the publication of final outputs. So it's not just about open access publication of research articles. It's about being open as we go along about our processes and allowing light to shine on what we're doing and allow air to come into the process. So as I mentioned, the project methods and the thinking of the project team are documented on the blog. There have been various means of sharing data and code and exchanging knowledge. There's a YouTube channel, a public Zotero library, the GitHub repository with those publicly accessible demonstrators. And I think this commitment to openness and sharing of process is something that's been happening right across the Towards a National Collection programme so that everybody gets lifted up by the work that's going on in these projects. We're very committed to open access publication as well, uh, wherever possible, and uh, that comes back to the responsible bit. It isn't always possible, depending on the kind of data that you're working with, and with the most permissive licensing allowable. And that does sometimes mean losing control. Uh, permissive licensing means you can't determine what people will do with your data. So that's uh, coming to an accommodation with that is something that can be quite challenging within cultural heritage organizations, I think. And the provision of fair data, so data that's findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. It's not just paying lip service to openness, but is actually allowing people to use it and work with it in ways that we might not even be able to think of. Something else that the digital humanities can bring and humanities backgrounds generally and the curatorial expertise throughout this project is around context. And you would have seen from Callian's visualization of the whole collection that the project used data from three main institutions or sources, and that's the Science Museum Group, 
the Victoria and Albert Museum and Wikidata. So we need to find ways to present that so that researchers are aware um, and a question was asked about um, the accuracy of data, for example, allowing people to have that context so they can make those decisions about what they do and don't want to rely on. And even within a single institution, as you saw, there are many kinds of data that have been combined here, journal articles, blog posts and catalogue records, and they've all been produced by different people over varying periods of time. So how can we think about capturing and demonstrating that? How do we consider researcher positionality and how this influences data and technology choices? What do we bring to this as researchers and how that how might that affect the outputs and how can we talk about that in open ways? And connected to that is thinking about the influence of institutional histories and organisational profiles. When was a new catalogue introduced? What did that do to the way people thought about and described their data? How important is it for people to know that? And this has led to us thinking about developing and publishing data stories in future, pro future projects like the congruence engine, which will build on this work, helping people to understand the data that we're presenting to them. And finally, and um, this has been uh, an aim right the way through the project, and you will have seen it on some of the earlier slides as well, is considering navigation and discovery through visualisation, particularly when we're dealing with these really huge data sets. So that's allowing the exploration of alternative routes into GLAM collections at scale, involving moving away from keyword searching and structured browsing. Those are still enormously useful, and you saw some of the challenges of not having that in that large visualisation. It's very hard to pinpoint a single piece of information but we're doing something different with visualization and presenting it at that macro level representing the range and scope of the collections visually you could see that diagram and just have a sense of the scope of it without knowing the individual items that make it up and we're also considering using visualization not just as a means of communicating research results but as a tool for research itself we can start to see connections we wouldn't have expected kinds of information that sit alongside each other where there might be gaps what's missing what isn't present in this visualization and overall thinking about how to make data more accessible without hiding its provenance and complexity. And that brings us back to openness again. Um, the single search box hides all of that complexity that I think was very apparent uh, in the work that's been presented today. But how do you do that in ways that don't make it seem kind of off-puttingly complex for people? Um, so that is everything from me, a few more links here, many of which have been posted in the chat as well, and the usual acknowledge acknowledgements to all of the wonderful partners that have made this such a fantastic project to work on. So thank you very much. I will stop sharing my screen there. Well, thanks very much, Jane. That's a fantastic survey of... Uh... Of, of, of the digital humanities um, side of the project and I must say it's been the most fantastic collaboration between the the, the different parties um, I have a I have a just a, a couple of questions that have come up uh, please mm -hmm. don't feel shy about uh, adding uh, further questions um, to, to the Q&A uh, if there's something you want to know about any of the presentations um, a technical question came in are we saving the chat and can we share it uh, the chat can certainly be shared, uh, it can be saved. Um, I imagine it can be shared. Um, I will look to John for this, who's just unmuted, helpfully. <laughs> yeah, so uh, yes, we can. I'll just, once it's, uh, we'll get it and we'll anonymize it. And then we'll post it when we do put the recordings online. It's a perfect example of responsible and ethical openness right there. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so there's a very nice question uh, that, that came through, which is, which is about the fuzziness of data. Mm -hmm. um, and the question is, does work that's good enough to work, does data that's good enough to work with feel comfortable in digital humanities? Because I think the assumption in, in museums has been that we want to move towards something that's tighter and more authoritative. But what we're finding is, is is something which is looser. Is that the digital humanities world dealing with that? I, I think it is, yes. And um, there is huge benefit in that tightness, what Jamie was talking about with the persistent IDs and unique identifiers. That's really valuable. 
But with the resources we have available, the scale of the data, we can't do that with everything. Um, and uh, you know, the national collection is about scale to an extent. So finding ways to generate connections that we can have a reasonable degree of confidence in. I think demonstrating and expressing confidence measures is part of this work. How do I know how reliable what I'm looking at is? But I think that the humanities bit of digital humanities is about the messiness and complexity of data because it's about people and we're messy and complex. And trying to streamline that in ways that cut out that fuzziness completely, I think we lose a really important part of the picture. So navigating between those two things is, is where the fun stuff happens a lot of the time, I think. And we've seen some of that in this project, which has tightened up some things, but also made some things even more ambiguous than they were before. Um, um, and those are really interesting research questions. I mean, I think some of that m desire for the authoritative on the museum side is because it's been so difficult to do the sort of work that that, that, that we that we've been doing here. But and we've done that because we've wanted our users to be able to find, if you like, similar things, um, and that requires control terminology and and and, and all that all that kind of thing. Um, but um, I don't think we've particularly asked the users yet um, how much fuzziness they can live with. And that's one of the things that we'll be doing with, with, with Congruence Engine. Yeah, I think for me as a researcher, if it's all 100% confident, you said, well, what's the point of my research here? I, I want something fuzzy that I can look at and find something that nobody else has found before. So, so a degree of fuzziness is, is almost the point in some areas, I think. <laughs> And finally, I'd just like to tease you a little bit about that bridging metaphor for mm -hmm. digital humanities. Um, does the bridge sometimes feel very long and as though it's going across a very deep gorge? Yes, perhaps even wobbly at points. Um, so, <laughs> but yeah, that, but that's, I think, this importance of developing a common language that um, on huge projects like this, um, there are a really wide range of different levels of expertise and exposure to digital methods and talking through those in ways that don't leave anybody behind is really important because uh, otherwise you miss key input um, and these are not the inclusive kinds of projects that we want to work on so uh, so it is sometimes difficult but um, when it works it's fantastic well thank you very much um, let me just check um, okay so there's a couple of uh, comments so, and questions here. Um, uh, David Bryson says, don't we still need serendipity in research, finding out more to overcome the fuzzies? Yes, <laughs> definitely. Uh, I remember a few years ago, the first time I heard the phrase engineered serendipity, which just felt a bit, not sure I like that really. Um, I think uh, human serendipity is absolutely still crucial here. Uh, and, and actually seeing Callion playing around with his visualisation, you can see part of that is serendipity. You don't know what a dot is until you click on it. And then, oh, that's an interesting looking cluster. Let's go and see. And um, Sadie Frost says, Thanks, Jane. I really like what you said about radical openness in this project. Do you think this kind of work is pushing at the boundaries of how academia has tended up until now to operate? I really hope so. And I should another hat tip to my colleague, Teal Triggs, who was the person who first introduced the concept of radical openness to me, which has kind of affected everything I've done since that conversation. But yes, I really hope so. Um, and that ability to fail and be open about failure and as well as sharing successes and the process is so important to be open about because that's what helps other people to learn as we go along. And it's not about saving it all for that publication at the end. So yes, Lady, I absolutely hope um, that's the kind of example that projects like this and the Towards a National Collection programme can set by being open throughout. That's fantastic. Well, I think it's some time for it's time for some demos now. So uh, I think we're handing over to Tristan. Yeah, great. Thanks, Jane and Tim. It's over to you, Tristan.